Let's talk about tech integration goals for you. We start with do no harm, and of course, that's where we start in medicine, but it's where we start in education as well. We don't ever want to use technology in any way that's going to harm children or put them at risk. We acknowledge and address the concerns about screen time and tech overuse and misuse. Those concerns, as I've mentioned, are louder and harder and deeper felt than ever right now because kids are spending a lot of time on screens, and, and they have to, to do the remote learning that they're doing with you. We need to know what matters and apply what, what we know to teaching and learning in the classroom, hybrid and remote modes, whatever mode of teaching and learning you find yourself in, we need to know these same kinds of things as it relates to technology integration. We start with connecting the dots between child development, early learning, social and emotional learning, and children's appropriate use of technology and digital media. That's really the heart of this position statement and of the work that I've been doing. We need to understand the complex influences of family, culture, community, access, and equity. Very complicated. They're complicated in all ways and across all topics that we, that we address, but we have been reminded recently that they are also front end issues around uh, access and, uh, and technology. We need to strive for developmentally informed tech integration and evidence-based practices. And the evidence-based practices and developmentally informed integration is coming along slowly. We're starting to get the research cycle is starting to tell us more and more about what really works and, and how best to, to do these things. So we've got to pay attention to that, even as you develop your own evidence-based practices in your own classroom. We need to apply principles and guidelines for effective use from the field. That's where I'm going to come back to the national position statement. We need to think about 50 years of children's media research. It's not that we don't know anything about children learning from a screen. We've been studying this very hard from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Sesame Street on to today and Daniel Tiger. We do know a lot about screen-based learning for young children and what it takes to teach through the screen. So that can help, I think, inform some of our thinking and some of your practice in remote teaching and learning. And then we need, in, need to integrate best practices in the classroom, hybrid and remote teaching and learning, and technology integration. We need to pull those all together. Uh, and, and I think when we think about technology and I think about your different modes of teaching, um, I, I'm not seeing lots of differences from me. Yeah, the mode changes, but what you fundamentally do as an educator and what you believe and how you deliver content so that children will learn stays the same. I want to know just to become connected educators, to share your success stories. We're using connected education in a sense right now in this asynchronous model that we've got. I'm, I'm here talking to you. You're watching this wherever you are and, and whenever you have the opportunity, but we're sharing ideas and we're sharing best practices. And that's, that's really important now as educators across the country face the same challenges you're facing. And then I'm going to nudge you at, at the end of this uh, presentation about this new role that we've been defining as being a media mentor. And, and why children, parents, and families need media mentors now more than ever, but they'll continue to need them long after the pandemic is over, and why you sit at a critical place in that conversation around media mentorship. Seymour Papert in 1980 started, wrote Mindstorms and, and started this whole revolution and evolution of thinking around young children and technology and how technology could serve child development and, and learning. Um, so someone who really got my attention when my career just began, uh, recently did a, a book with a, a bunch of thought leaders in the, in the country. And we use this kind of idea, this one quote from Seymour as a, as a rallying point uh, for the way we were thinking and writing about technology. He said this, when one enters a new domain of knowledge, one initially encounters a crowd of new ideas. Good learners are able to pick out those which are powerful. I'll guarantee you in the next 50 minutes or so, I'm gonna give you a crowd of new ideas. I'm gonna go fast and we're gonna cover a lot of ground and I'm gonna give you things to think about. Out of those things, out of that crowd of new ideas, be listening for those things that really resonate to you, that you think are the most powerful ideas that you're hearing today as we, as we spend this time together. That's what Seymour was after. That's what he was trying to encourage us to think about as thinkers and as learners. Um, look for those things that really uh, stand out to you. So that's exciting to think about. A couple of ideas from colleagues from the, from the new book uh, that came out in the last year. David Kleeman said this, the concept of screen time has become meaningless in a world where screens bring entertainment, learning, discovery, communication, play, creation, and more. Powerful statement that 
hold on to those words, we'll come back to it later. But this notion that screen time is much more now, much more today, than just how much time does one child spend in front of a television set. Uh, we've got lots more to think about. He also talked about ubiquitous interactivity and what he meant by that was, as we all carry around these digital devices from a smartphone to a tablet to, to any other device that you use, we are now able to interact with anyone anywhere at any time on any device. That's a really powerful idea. There's, there's one for Seymour, anytime, anywhere with anyone on any device about anything, right? And so this notion that we really have this ability to interact nonstop in a way that we never had before is a really upside of this kind of technology. And it leads to this quote from my, my colleague Warren Buckleitner at Children's Technology Review. Mobile technology has made us the first generation of parents to be physically far from our grown children, but we have the capacity to be psychologically closer. And I, I will tell you personally that this really resonates to me because we live in Utah and I have a daughter in California and another daughter in Wisconsin. And the only way we're staying together and psychologically close is via technology. And without it, we wouldn't have that opportunity. And later today, we'll all jump on a call together and see each other and talk with each other. So this, uh, I think Warren really is onto something here that this is something, while we didn't grow up digital and we weren't born into the digital age, these digital tools are bringing us real um, uh, advantages, real lifelines as well. And then Michael Levine, who's now at Noggin, but was with the, uh, um, Joan Gantz Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop for many years wrote this. Kids' enthusiasm for digital activities presents a great hook for teachers and busy parents to manage their responsibilities. But if teachers and parents themselves do not become technically proficient, the full range of digital possibilities and the access to new technological tools will effectively be reserved for the more privileged. There's that access and equity question again. But it's also a nudge to you and to me and to all of us as adults in this digital age. We have to do the work to become technically proficient as well. Only when we do that work will children get the full benefit of these new tools that, that, that they were born into. Here's one I want you to take a, a moment to think about as well. It's what I call avoiding the false dichotomy. And if you look at the image on the screen, the sign says, do not enter. And then the second sign says, enter only. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Do I go there or do I not go there? And that's that dichotomy. Is it do not enter or is it enter only? I'm going to argue that it's not either or. It's never either or. It's not all tech or no tech. It's not tech or play. It's not tech or nature. It's not screens are bad or screens are good. It's not children are more isolated than ever or children are more connected than ever. It's, it's never either or, it's the gray area in between. We have some concerns, we also have some benefits. So my little line at the bottom, I think, cap captures that. We can address problematic screen use and find ways to maximize benefits. If we have concerns about overuse or misuse of screens, we do need to deal with them. We do need to help children and parents and families deal with that. But that doesn't mean that we ignore the, the benefits that come from using technology well. Right? It's never either or.